Our first, uh, our plenary speaker today is John Argue. He's the creator of the John Argue Method, and he will be talking about Parkinson's disease and the art of moving. You'll notice that all of the speaker bios are in your program on page eight. John Argue is an actor, director, and theater arts teacher who has lived and worked in the San Francisco Bay Area since 1960. Since 1985, he has taught movement and voice for people with Parkinson's disease at his studio in Berkeley, at Kaiser Permanente, and other health facilities. His personal experience as an actor and storyteller brings a creative and enlivening dimension to the program, making it not only valuable, but also a whole lot of fun. Please join me in welcoming John Argue. Here's the basic lecture, huh? Parkinson's disease is a neurological, progressive, insidious, non-fatal disease. That's the official definition in the book, in the, uh, the physician's desk, desk reference. Neurological. All these things have important things having to do with, with how you manage your Parkinson's. In that it's a neurological disease, the idea about that is, the good news about that is there's nothing wrong with your muscles, right? Other things being equal. I mean, we're all older now, and muscles are not as strong as they used to be, and maybe we picked up some slouches and things like this. But the muscles are still there. They still function. The problem is in the, 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 the control mechanism, in the brain. The second issue is that it's progressive. It, it gets worse and worse and worse and worse over time. It starts with a few minor symptoms and just continues to get worse. All the medications that we've found so far, they can make life a lot more comfortable for people. They can treat the symptoms. But as far as we know so far, we've not been able to stop the progression of the disease. It just seems to progress. Third thing is it is insidious. That kind of sounds sneaky, doesn't it? Insidious means that it gets worse a little at a time, right? Now, I have heart disease, so I have big episodes, right? And I have a, you know, I had a heart attack and surgery. Oh, you don't want to hear about it. Anyway, uh, so I have, you know, a disease in which has big episodes. Parkinson's doesn't have big episodes. It doesn't get worse all at once. You don't wake up one morning and your Parkinson's is ten times worse. It gets worse sneakily. Sneaky, 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 sneaky. So in a way, that's a good thing and a bad thing. The bad thing is it gets worse so sneakily that you just adapt. You hardly notice that this left hand doesn't work so much anymore or as well, and that you're using your right hand for things you used to use your left hand for. You don't notice that you're taking smaller steps. You just take smaller steps on and on and on like that. So there's an insidious progression. Finally, it's a non-fatal disease. That's the good news. The doctor will tell you having Parkinson's is the best neurological disease to have. You're not going to die from it. Okay? You'll die of something else. Of course, we all do that. But you won't die from Parkinson's. Okay? But that's the bad news also. You know, you're, you're going to live out the whole life, natural lifespan of your life, and you and your family are going to have to be dealing with this for 20 or 30 years. Right? If, you, if you get it, say, at 60, you could live to 90 easily and still have Parkinson's. So the hardship for the family over a long period of time is pretty dramatic. The family has to be, adjust itself quite dramatically in order to work with Parkinson's. Now, you know, I have heart disease, as I say, and my wife is not going to have hardly any trouble at all. I'm just going to have a heart attack, boom, and she's going to have to come around and say, yeah, that's him, and that's it. <laughs> that's it. Whereas with Parkinson's, you've got to continually learn how to manage this new symptom, that new symptom. How do the medications change this? How do this, you know, what happens with the diet? What happens with sleep? On, on, on. It's a continual learning process through the whole course of the disease. Continual learning. You'll be an expert on Parkinson's 
after three or four years. You'll know as much as your doctor after 10 years. Yeah. Everybody in Parkinson's gets to be an expert. I'm going to show you the insidious progression. Thank you for the little tip there. He, I've got a friend down here, when he doesn't hear me, he goes. <laughs> That's very helpful. Okay, anybody else that wants to do that can do that too. Uh, the progression of symptoms, right? We'll go back to that issue. And I'm going to use some of my acting skills just to show you the progression of Parkinson's symptoms, which is important to understand why the, the exercise program that I designed is designed the way it is. Okay, so I'm gonna give myself Parkinson's gradually, gradually, gradually. So I'm walking along, nothing, you know, I'm just an ordinary guy um, coming up on 60, 65, somewhere in there, and I feel fine doing all the things I always used to do except that my right arm stopped swinging and I didn't notice because, you know, it just stopped. And uh, my hand on that side began to curl up a little bit, but I didn't pay any attention to it because I could still make it do what I wanted to do, but it just didn't swing when I walked. That was kind of odd. I didn't notice. In fact, nobody noticed until a year later when my son was home from college or whatever and he said, Dad, your arm isn't swinging. Did you hurt your arm? doesn't swing. So on you go. You're not even diagnosed yet. Pretty soon your other arm stops swinging and you start taking a smaller step. You don't notice you're taking a smaller step. You just take a smaller step. And you lean forward a little bit. And the hands curl up a little bit. Right? And you may develop a tremor somewhere in there. Oh my goodness, now you're going to go to the doctor and he's going to take one look at you because he's seen, a lot of, he's, he's seen a lot of people with Parkinson's. He's going to take one look at you and say, I think you have Parkinson's. Right? And then he'll do a few tests and he'll tell you you have Parkinson's. So the symptoms progress onward. Your toes begin to turn toward each other a little bit when you walk. And your knees don't straighten all the way when you take a step. They're a little bit bent and the back now begins to curve and your elbows don't straighten either. And your face becomes kind of blank. And people think you're not quite clear in your mind. You may be, but they look at your face and they say, well, he's not really there. So the face is kind of disappearing a bit. And the, you have a tremor in the hand and the knees are turning in. And you're taking these short steps. And when you go to go sit in a chair, you're turning around like this. And you go toward a chair, you start like this, you get over here, and you start turning out here. You're sitting about halfway on the chair. And you have to just just get yourself over. So, okay. So gradual progression of symptoms, huh? Gradual turning in. The hands begin to be less less able, one side more than the other. Face becomes blank. Voice becomes very soft. Finally, it's very hard to hear. There's some parts of the day you don't speak at all. Right? The voice gets so quiet that it's hard for people to understand you. And your wife needs a hearing test because she doesn't, <laughs> doesn't hear you. <clears throat> uh, and you have to repeat yourself all the time. Okay. Well, now, that's the progression of symptoms. And here's my statement. People with Parkinson's should have exercise class every week for the rest of their lives. Every one of those symptoms, you can push back at every one of those symptoms. You can push back at the hands curling like this. You can push them open again. You can push the arms straight. You can straighten the leg. You can turn the toe out. 
you can even build the, the upper back so that the back straightens up and the person is standing upright. You can train yourself to bring your heel forward when you walk instead of shuffling on the balls of your feet. You can train all of that and you practice and practice and practice and you keep practicing week in, week out, for the rest of your life. And if you do that, here's my statement, you can end your life pretty much in the same posture that you had just before you got diagnosed. You can push those symptoms back and recover a great deal. I mean, other things being equal. It's not perfect every time. But you can push those symptoms back and keep yourself able to do stuff that you, you, you haven't been able to do for quite a while. So that's the point of the exercise program that I designed. Uh, there, are, there is one extremely powerful medicine. That probably, how many of you take levodopa carbidopa, also called Cinemet? Vast numbers, okay. That's a very effective medication. Some people don't start on it early, but at any rate, most people with Parkinson's wind up using that medication. The only other treatment for Parkinson's that is as effective as Cinemet is exercise, okay? Is exercise. That's better than all the other medications that you take for, sim for symptoms. This has been studied uh, and, and the proof is there. Exercise is the second most important medicine for people with Parkinson's. Okay. Uh, there's even some recent research that suggests that exercise actually does slow down the disease. We can't prove that because we can't tell some group of Parkinsonians, don't you exercise, we're gonna see how bad it gets for you. <laughs> so we can't prove, but we do notice, right, and, and the, all the exercise teachers, there's a big strong movement toward exercise clear across the country. This is the 57th trip I've taken to make a, a talk like this. So it's not my first rodeo. So, uh, but I've been doing it now for, for 20 years, and uh, Becky Farley's been doing it, and Dance for PD has been a latecomer, but they're in. Um, many people are adding to the, the strong program toward getting all the people with Parkinson's to exercise on and on and on, weekly for the rest of your life. Okay, what kind of exercise? What kind of exercise seems best? And this is perhaps my bias, but I call my program the art of moving. Uh, actors are artists. This is, our, this is our medium. Painter uses paint, actor uses his body. Same thing, he's an artist and by using the art of moving, you can, uh, let me sh say more about that. Art, what is art? Uh, art is mindful, that is your mind, it's actually a, a mental controlled event. It's mindful. Art is usually graceful, particularly acting, right? You're doing things that that look better than what ordinary people do, right? You, you try to be graceful. And the third thing is you complete things. The stories you tell as an actor are have a beginning, middle, and end. When you do a, a cross to sit, if you're the king, the throne is there, you cross, you turn, and you sit. So there's a beginning to the cross, there's a beginning to the turn, there's a beginning to the sit, and there's an ending to each one of those things, right? I'll explain why that's important a little bit later. But the three features in the exercise program that I pound into my students over and over is mindful, graceful, and complete. Graceful means you learn to do things that in a way that actually gets them done. It's a combination of power and ease, okay? Grace is a combination of power and ease. Power 
You actually get the job done. If you meant to sit down, you sit down. Right? That was your intention, and you accomplish it. Uh, it's graceful. You do it an easy way. A combination of grace and power, I mean, of, of power and ease makes grace. Okay? Okay. It defines grace. All right. Let me now have some exercises with you. Okay? That's a lot more fun than just listening to me talk. Uh, <clears throat> in mindfulness, you're thinking through every movement. You're thinking what you're doing. Okay? So now, if you can, uh, some of you are taking notes, and that's fine. Uh, remember that it's all there in a the book. So you can just buy the book. You don't need the note. Anyway, if you would like to, you put your book away and scoot your chair a little separate from the table. Just enough so that you can um, maybe do a few stretches with me. I'm going to do them sitting. Just going to do sitting. You're not going to be, I'm not going to be asking anybody to stand up. I want you to walk on your buns out to the front. Video, you should be getting the whole class doing this. This is kind of fun. Now walk on your buns back. Feel that little walking movement with your, okay, walk on your buns back. Okay, now walk forward again. Oh, you look like a bunch of penguins. <laughs> okay, you're sitting forward in front of your chair. Good. Lace your fingers together. Push them all the way in. Thumbs up. Now turn them thumbs down. Okay, now this is one that's going to open your hands more and straighten your elbows. Push and look at your elbows and see if they come straight. Yeah, you got a little ways to go. Some of us have a little ways to go, which is fine. We do this every class. At the beginning of every class, we do this again. Now raise your hands and wave the flag. Oh, and grunt a little bit. Oh. Okay, and then bring your hands down between your knees. So set your knees wide and your feet wide. And I want you to imagine a baby lying down here on the floor. She's only two weeks old. She's all wrapped up. And she's lying on the floor between your knees, right between your feet. Reach down and get your hands under that little sweetheart and bring her up right up to you. Keep gazing in her eyes, gazing in her eyes. Bring her right up here. Give her a kiss and tuck her in your heart. Okay, so how many of you actually touched the floor? A few, a few, you see. If we do this every time, over and over and over and over, you begin to get a stretch inside your thigh, right? Remember how the knees, the feet turned in toward each other? The knees began to hit, hit each other? This is designed to push the knees out and away from each other and stretch that muscle, which is hypertonic. It's too tight. Hypertonic means too tight. So here we That's go. That's exercise one. Exercise two. Bring your left hand across your right knee. Yeah. And reach around with your right hand and shake hands with the person behind you if you can find them. Or imaginary person. That's fine. And then come back the other way. And right hand over the left knee and you reach around with your left hand. Oh, yeah. And you feel that twist in your back? That's the one we're after. We're after this rotation, yes? This rotation. Let's do it again. Left hand over right knee, right hand around the back, and twist, and look over the back. See if you can see this guy, too. And pull a little bit with your arm, with your hand, and then come back to the front. And around you go the other way. Uh, 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 uh. Make a little noise, ah, like a creaky gate, and back you come. And so then you got this twist, right? You got the twist at the waist. This is one that is lost in Parkinson's. You see people walking around like a little block of refrigerator, right? Like a, boom, 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 boom. So they don't have this twist in the waist. 
but we can get it back if we practice. Now, next one, we're going to take our right hand, right? hold on to the chair with your left hand, and then lean over like you're going to fall off the chair, and then let that hand drop and see if you can brush the floor away over there. And you feel the stretch in the back? Good. And then up you come, grab the chair, this hand goes up, and down you go. Down, down, and touch, and then come on back up. There you go. Now that looks quite simple, yeah? You're kind of holding, you're not, nothing complicated there. But this is the first part of an exercise that gets more and more complicated through the whole series. Eventually, I'm training you to catch yourself in a back to the side fall. See that? So getting used to bringing that hand down to the floor and breaking your fall. People with Parkinson's fall, right? They fall. So we train in the art of moving. We train to survive a fall. If you try to prevent all falls, you just strap yourself in a wheelchair and never get up. But if you try to survive a fall, so you go to the floor without getting hurt. Go to the floor with, maybe, you know, if you fall in a parking lot and there's gravel, you may tear your hand a little bit, but you don't have to break your hip or your elbow or smash your glasses, right? You can bring your hands to the floor first and save yourself from that. Yeah, so, okay. And then the fourth exercise, you're sitting forward on the chair still. Lift your knee and pull it in and see if you can get your chin to touch your knee. <laughs> this used to be easier when I did it. <laughs> it's gotten harder <clears throat> in the last 29 years. <clears throat> and sitting forward in the chair, lean back a little bit, pick up both knees. Oh. <laughs> now this strengthens the lowest part of your belly, right? This part underneath all of last night's accumulation. Uh, yeah, it strengthens the, those low muscles inside your, inside your pelvis down in there. Those are very important for maintaining your balance and for saving yourself when you lose your balance. You grab there and you, you get control of the whole lower half of your body, right? Just those muscles right down there. People call that the core. core. Okay, good. Okay, now, <clears throat> I'm going to scoop my chair back a little bit, and I'm going to show you, not everybody can do this exercise, but I'm going to show you how to get out of a chair mindfully. Okay, and I'm going to show you two different ways to do it. A lot of you have trouble getting out of a chair, yes? You see a person trying to get up out of a chair, they're going, Honey? <laughs> yeah, that's the way, yeah. Okay, there's another way. I'm going to scoot the chair back so that I can, I don't fall off this thing here. And it's built on that exercise that we just started, right? It's part, so all these exercises that we do over and over and over again, they accumulate and we keep building more complicated skills, sort of like Chinese boxes, right? Okay. Uh, tai Chi has done the same way. I studied Tai Chi for many years. And it starts very simple. and gets harder and harder and harder. Okay, so here's the, here's the drill. You walk on your buns out to the front edge of the chair. Okay, now, people who are with people who are not really safe standing up, you stop your guy or your gal. Don't let her try this, okay? So, little safety here. Don't want anybody to be falling. So you're sitting forward, your legs are apart. You gently pull one foot back, sort of under the front edge of your chair. Your hands are here. They're inside your knees. Remember that baby? Okay, that baby's still there. Only this time, when I, watch me now, watch how I do this. I'm gonna reach down and get the baby and lift my backside and pull her up. Give her a kiss, tuck her away. But let me show it to you again. You're here, this comes up, and then this comes up. So you're really lifting 
you're lifting only half of your weight with each part of the move. When I come down here and my fingers are on the floor, I'm just lifting the back half. And now I lift the front half, right? The top half. So that's why it works so much easier. The legs, even old people's legs are strong enough to do that. Okay, here's a way which is a little bit more uh, for people who had a little bit of trouble with that one. Sa starts the same way, you work out to the front of the chair, right? You pull one foot back, and the foot that you pull back, you put a hand on that knee. The other hand, you put around behind you on the seat of the chair, right? Now watch this. Just watch for starts. I'm gonna kiss this knee, mm, and push my back end up, and then I'm gonna come all the way up. Ta-da! Okay, so I push with both hands. So lean down to kiss the knee, down you go. Push with both hands, that gets you off the chair, and then come all the way up. You see that? Now to get down, same thing. You reach back with one hand, reach the other hand to the knee, and ease yourself back into the chair. Right. So you're not having those, that drop into the chair, right, when your legs give out. You have a little brace there to slow you down. Okay. All right, while we're on uh, standing up, I guess I'll do one more. This is from the uh, caregiver's video, how to get up off a, off a, a toilet seat. Built on the same idea, you come forward, but you don't come all the way forward on the toilet seat. Instead, you reach down here and you put your hand on the middle of the seat. If it's a male toilet, you know, those projected, you've got it made. And with the other hand, you reach down, touch the floor, and lever yourself forward and up. Ta-da! And to sit down, same way. Put your hand between your legs, find the front of the seat, and ease yourself down. Nice straight arm here, huh? This arm nice and straight and strong. Lever yourself up. Good. And then reach between your knees, front of the chair, and lever yourself down. Ta-da! Okay, very nice. So that's mindfulness, right? That's thinking each part of a move, figuring out how to do it, doing it in sequence, not rushing. The problem with Parkinson's is that <clears throat> the part of the brain that is most affected by the Parkinson's disease, you know, there's a deterioration actually inside the brain. Certain part of the brain loses this uh, dopamine making power and the, the cells actually die back. There's an actual dieback in, this, in the substantia nigra. We don't know what makes that happen. But the part of the brain that is affected most is the part of the brain that controls automatic movements. Things that you do without even thinking. You haven't thought about them since you were two years old, how to get up. You just stand up. Everybody just, they don't think about how to stand up. They just stand up. You don't think about how to get up off the floor. You just get up, right? Because you've, you've done it so long, the automatic part of the brain stores all those things, and you can, improvise on the fly. You can get up and pick up your watch and your cell phone at the same time and still be texting. If, if, you're, if the basal ganglia is still working properly. But with Parkinson's, that's the part of the brain, the automatic part, the part that handles automatic sequencing of complicated actions, the part that handles uh, how to get up, how to, how to get in and out of a car, um, how to, you know, all those things that you never think about, you just do. Those are the things that are, have become awkward with Parkinson's. So Parkinson's people need to be mindful. They think about how to do each of those things. They think about, think about, think the mind is controlling each part of the action, okay? So the, the conscious mind, the front part of the brain overrides the basal ganglia, which is an automatic part of the brain. Right? That's what it's meant, meant by people with Parkinson's are condemned to conscious movement. Actors move from that part of the brain. They move from the, from the 
the, the top part of the brain, not from the basal ganglia. It may look nonchalant, like, you know, oh, no, I've, but he has practiced that walk, that nonchalant walk, 30 times before you see him, well, I don't know. He's doing the same walk over, you know, every time he does that same walk. But you only see it once, right? So it looks, it looks natural, but he really is doing it on purpose. He's doing everything on purpose. And you must learn to do everything. You must become actors. Actors, dancers. You become actors, dancers. Not the worst fate in the world. Might be for Coloradans, I don't know. <laughs> All right, onward. Graceful. Okay. Uh, let me show you how to get up from the floor, a mindful way to get up from the floor. I'm going to show, and a few of you will be able to do this. Um, it looks like this. Say you find yourself on the floor, right? One way or another. Maybe you, in, your, in my class, you'll get to the floor on purpose over and over. Here's how you get to the floor. You sit forward, separate your knees, bring one foot. You've heard this before, right? So I build all these things together. Then, you, instead of picking up the baby, you start walking on your hands out here and then put your knees down without a bump. Right? So now you're down on the floor. We can do all kinds of things on the floor while you're down here. When you're my age, you do that. You look around to see if there's anything else you can do before you have to get up. <laughs> but, so here you are. You're down and we've done all our stuff we're going to do and now it's time to get back up. You might have even fallen. This is how to get up without hurting yourself again. Okay? If you try to stand up out in the open without any thought about it, try to do it automatically, you might re-injure yourself. Okay? Here's how to do it consciously. You turn back toward your chair, come right up to it, get right here, get your hands on the seat of the chair. Then you bring one knee up, Outside the elbow. Do you see how the knee is outside the elbow? Here's the elbow, here's the outside. It could be on the other side too, but it would still be outside the elbow. If I try to bring my knee up inside the elbow, oh, I see. See this, I'm jammed, right? But if I bring it up outside the elbow, no problem. Then I put my head down and I put this up. Head down. Oh, and this up, Woo. and then up I come, ta-da, right? So I lift the back end first, and then the front end. This means when your partner is down, you don't get him under the arm and start trying to wrestle him up and injure your own back. Then we got two people injured, right? No, no. You bring him a chair, here dear. <laughs> I'm going back to the kitchen. <laughs> so, off you go. So, right? so you bring them a chair and let them struggle their own way up. That is part of their empowerment. Right? The more you let your Parkinson's partner, if you are a partner with a Parkinson's person, if you're a partner with a Parkinson's person, <laughs> the more you let them do, the more power you give them. Right? You let them hold on to their power. That, po that power is essential because of their dignity. The more they can do for themselves, the more they feel dignified, right? The more they feel they're still themselves. And also, they want to do as much as they can for themselves to take the load off of you. They're still your partner. They're still trying to help you have an easier time, right? So the person with Parkinson's is contributing as much as they possibly can to ease the burden for the caregiver. Okay, that's really important. And just assume that that's, that's the, everybody's intention. And you know, sure you have lapses, you know. Everybody has a lapse. Oh, I want you to get it for me, you know. I do that too, you know. I'm, I'm in bed, why don't you make my tea for me? And so, no, but the basic, basic drill is you empower your partner by letting your partner do as much as possible, right? 
You have to know that. But if you raised kids, you know that that's the truth. When you're raising kids, you let kids do what they can do. You don't do that for them. As soon as you see that they can do it themselves, back off. Turn, turn them loose. Let them do it. Let them do it. Right? I want to do it myself. Yeah. Okay. Getting in and out of a car. Ah, yes. Here we are. <clears throat> How am I doing on time? I get all wound up and stop noticing the time. I'm okay. Okay, getting in and out of a car. Uh, this is my car. We'll pretend it's a Lexus. <laughs> okay. Uh, passenger side. So, <clears throat> this is how people get into cars who don't have Parkinson's. They open the door, they stuck a long leg in there, they turn this way, and then they pull this foot up and in. Okay? And we've all done that forever. The lower the car, the more we do it this way. Uh, Parkinson's people, that's hard. That's hard. Here's how you get in and out of a car if you have Parkinson's. It helps to have this high-tech medical appliance. A shopping bag. Okay? And don't buy this at the medical supply store. <laughs> you get them for free at Walmart. So, this sits on the chair, on the seat. And the Parkinson's person, I'm gonna open the door, and instead of putting one foot in, I'm gonna turn around. Get my backside here, and back right up until I can feel the car against the back of my legs, down here. Then I'm gonna notice a $20 bill left on the floor, <laughs> on the street, right there. And I'm gonna reach down to get that 20, and there I am. Then I pull this one in, and I rotate so nice on this thing. So this, and then this one comes in, and Bob's your uncle. Right? So this is a lazy Susan. Okay, so lazy Susan, the the uh, material on a on a car for a Parkinson's person feels a little like Velcro. So they try, to, they try to rotate, it doesn't, they don't have that same feeling that most of us that don't have Parkinson's feel in their backside. They feel like, God, that's really stuck. And so having a lazy Susan there makes a big difference, okay? This you could just add, put several of them under here, under the passenger side. And when you're starting to get your Parkinson's person in, get them this, put it up there. I also use, uh, Leaf bags, you know, the big black ones, glad bags for leaves. That covers the whole seat, and uh, it's very useful. I keep a stash under here. Okay, that's getting out of the car, same thing, right? You, you rotate this foot out. Now, most people would just sort of whoop like this. They just kind of out they go. But Parkinson's people, that, or anybody, oh, look at that. Technology. <laughs> so to get out, you, again, you get both feet out, and the helper is here, the back of the seat. The back of the seat. This is the most steady piece you can get a hold of. Not the pull board, and not the door. The door can move. Back of the seat, you get the 20 again, Ugh, up you come. Okay, you get the idea, huh? And if you're driving, you can do the same thing on this side. Having that lazy Susan there makes a real difference in terms of getting in and out. A lot of newer cars also for Parkinson's people have this little thing on the steering wheel where you can lift the wheel up like this and then pull it back down. I've had it on my car for 15 years. I haven't used it yet. Uh, but, you know, it'd be nice to learn how to use that little tilter to get it out. 
while we're on cars, I will say this, that people with Parkinson's, uh, if, you, if it's time to replace a car, you want to go for an SUV, one of the mid-sized SUVs, because you don't have that deep bend in the knees, right? How many of you are driving SUVs now? Oh, I'm preaching to the choir. Okay. All right. Yeah, I give a lot of people with Parkinson's a ride, so I got an SUV. Convinced my wife. <laughs> the automatic part of the brain controls the sequencing of seri series of actions. Okay? And the, uh, that's the part that does not function properly with Parkinson's. Okay? So that when the king went over and sat down, he completed each one of the three moves. But a parkin, you know, just to walk over and sit down is no problem. I don't have to think, I can go on talking with you and never miss, right? But a Parkinson's person is going to do it a different way. Now notice the sequence. There are three actions. There's the cross, the turn, and the sit. Okay? So in my class, what we do is we, we punctuate the completion of each portion we put a semicolon where the comma used to be. Follow me? So if you, yeah, you put the semicolon where the comma is supposed to be. So it's a series. So you cross, and when you get the cross finished, you stop and say, ta-da! And then you turn, and when you finish the turn, you say, ta-da! And then you sit. So you learn to pay attention to finishing each part. Without that, here's how the Parkinson's person goes. I showed you this earlier. He crosses here. Before he finishes the first part, he starts the second part. Before she finishes the second part, she starts the third part. She's not even there yet. She's already sitting down. You see that? She's aiming sort of on a slant toward the chair. And that's why she winds up with one bun on and one bun off, right? The sequence, the, the, the action has three parts. The second part steps on the heels of the first part. And the third part steps on the heels of the third, a second part. Follow me? This happens in speech as well, right? This happens in speech. People with Parkinson's don't finish their words. They get about halfway through the word and then they just go on the next one. So it's a little bit harder to understand what they're saying. Kind of runs together like that because they're, they're saying the whole phrase in the mind all at once. So it's kind of, it's slur. And the, so we train in the voice work to finish each word punctuate each ending. You make the end of the word as important as the beginning. Maybe more so. Right? How are you going to tell the difference between run and runt? Right? Run, runt. That little Run, run, everybody. Let me do one more demonstration exercise and then I'll open it for questions. So open your jaw nice and wide. This is the first exercise for voice class. You open your jaw nice and wide, take a big inhale through your, your mouth. <laughs> so already it happened. Yeah, that's the first exercise in voice is yawn out loud. Okay, so you make a nice little yawn sound. <sighs> you pretend to yawn if you can't really do it. Pretend. Sound. <laughs> it's the same sound as the yawn. 
Oh, how many of you sing in a choir? Lots of you. You know what I mean. Open throat. Oh, ha ha. Ha ha ha. How now? How now? How now, brown cow? Right, if you're doing it right, you yawn sometime in the middle of that exercise. It happens all by itself. Then we take an easy song. One that comes to mind right now is, it's my sad, happy song. <laughs> right now, to sing that with, and actually sing it as though we're, we've, sing, we've been singing it for half an hour trying to get the kids to go to sleep in the, in the campsite, and they will not stop. So we're all singing like this. If you yawned during that, you're doing it right, right. This opens the throat, and it lets a lot more sound out. When I switched from my microphone voice to my stage voice, what I do is I open my throat. And just by stretching the throat over and over and over and over and over again, the, the voice will open up a bit. This is very important for people with Parkinson's. How many of you have trouble swallowing? then yawn a lot Every, in your family. Everybody in your family is now uh, inaugurated in the yawn society. And you yawn noisily over and over and over and over again and rudely and effusively and give it all you got and make these big yawn sounds and your swallowing will get better. Okay. I'm not going to explain too much about that. I do it in the video. But you're stretching the muscles that you use when you swallow. You're stretching them when you yawn. And stretching them makes them more flexible. So that when you let go of them and then you try to use them, they've got somewhere to go. If they never stretch, then they have trouble going this way or that way. They have trouble going out or in. They, they get stiff in the middle. So the yawning stretches them open, and the swallowing, everybody take a big swallow. Ah! That's what you do in Colorado, right? Off, after the trail drive, you take a... Ah! Okay, I, I should make fun of Colorado. People with Parkinson's should have weekly exercise classes for the rest of their lives. Twice a week if you can manage. Uh, you know, but getting organized in the morning to get to a class at 10.30 and be done at 12, that's a half a day's work. That's more than a half a day's work for a pe person with Parkinson's and the caregiver, okay? So you want to take two days a week to do that? That's okay. Three days. The more you can do, the better. But you may want to do other physical things. You may want to take a yoga class or a dance class, or go swimming, or do water aerobics, or go for a walk with the dog, right? Something physical every day. Something that challenges you in a safe way. That's what we're after. Good, in a class you can be challenged safely. You won't, you, you're very unlike, I've, I've been teaching now for 29 years, had three injuries, that happened in my class. So in a class, you can, you can be safe, right? Be safe. Those three in injuries broke my heart. I'll have you know, I mean, I hate that. 
but that's the story. Questions? You can ask questions. Yeah, yeah. The, the, uh, the yawning starts the process. Yawning gets the muscles stretched. And then you can practice with applesauce doing a particular kind of swallowing. I'm not going to give you the technical name. But you swallow and then you do the cowboy thing. <coughs> right? Remember I did the cowboy thing a minute ago? So you, you take a spoon of applesauce. <coughs> you swallow it and then you go, <coughs> everybody. Take a spoon of applesauce, imaginary. Put it in your mouth. Mm. Swallow it. <coughs> you feel that little... <coughs> okay. What you're doing there is actually collecting little air in your lungs and right at the spot where your larynx opens into your, into your lungs, that this is not closing completely. Okay? The, let me see if I can demonstrate this. Here's your tongue. Here's your larynx. Okay, the larynx has got a hole in it. And in front of it, there's another tube that goes down to your stomach. This one goes into your lungs, okay, on either side. And your tongue is like this. You see this big fat part in the back? If you were a kid and your mom bought a cow's tongue, you remember yeah. how awful it looked? And then she'd boil it for a what long time, man. <laughs> oh. Okay, so there it is. So this is the fat part of the back of your tongue. When you swallow, what's supposed to happen is the larynx is supposed to come up and close itself on the fat part of the back of your tongue. If you look through there, you see how it's closed? Right? That's what it's supposed to do. Then your tongue kicks the food back and the food goes down to your stomach. But this thing, this travel here, has gotten attenuated. It doesn't do as much as it's supposed to. When you, when you yawn, you pull it down as far as it'll go. When you swallow, it comes up as far as it'll go. So getting it to go up and down is the problem. Got that? Big motion in that. So exercising by swallowing a lot and then practice that little <coughs> after a bite of App, try it with applesauce first. Uh, try it then with something a little firmer. Uh, I don't know. But, you know, it helps to have a, a little bit of, in, in your food, the stuff that you eat, you don't want to eat stuff that's too dry, right? Put a lot of butter on it. <laughs> I got a smile out of that. Okay, okay another question. Okay, the question is, the, the way the curb is when you're trying to get out of a car, right? In California, the rule is you get 18 inches from the curb. You can park 18 inches out from the curb. They have these marks on the street. If you line your car up with the outside mark and get a tape measure, you'll see that to your tire is about 18 inches. Okay? That's what you're allowed in California. Uh, of course, you're not going to have that in a narrow street, a one-way street, on a hill, things like this, where you, have to, where you have to curb your... So there are two or three things you can do. One, take what you're allowed. Take those 18 inches, okay? Learn how... The driver should learn how to park out away from the curb and give enough room there so the person can get their feet on the floor, on, on the... And then they step up onto the curb. Um, the other thing you can do is if there's no, you know, you're going to have to curb your wheels on a down slope or something, pull up to the next driveway. Let your person get out and have them stand there and you then back the car in and curb the wheels. So those are the two things that I recommend. Got that? And then third thing is, of course, I've got a couple of people that are, you know, in like this now. I'll get, I'll park the car, pull the emergency, get out of the car and get out and come around and, and uh, help them out. I still want them to stand, do their own standing, but I want to be the safety guy. For some, for some Parkinson's patients, I see that as they're walking, 
they tend to walk on the same plane or even have their feet cross. Uh, and, you know, that's obviously very dangerous. Are there exercises that help them um, avoid that? Yes, yes, exactly. That's exactly what happens. I, as I demonstrated, the feet begin to turn toward each other. And you see very advanced people with Parkinson's will actually step on their toes, step on their own toes, okay, because the toe, knees are turned in so far. See that? So how do you get them to turn their feet out? Well, you start by stretching this muscle here, and that, that's the picking up the baby with the knees out wide. You get that stretch. There's lots of other exercises you do throughout the whole course of the thing, which keeps that, that opening. Then when I get them into standing and gait work, which is you know, lesson 10, then we do all kinds of gait problems. I'll set little pads on the floor in this pattern. So they have to go da, 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 da. So they have to walk like that. Then I ask them to walk without the pads. Sometimes I turn that into a game. Walk like a sailor. Right? On the town. On the town is open in New York again. <laughs> did, did you read about that? Yeah, on the town. Uh, you know, they play. So like this, like this, like this. Frank Sinatra. You don't know that? Sure. We have a question down over here regarding handwriting. I'm over here. Hi. Hi, handwriting. Hi. Hi. We have a question regarding the handwriting and with the trimmers and the small. Are, are there any exercises that can help with that fine uh, motor coordination? You're, you're dealing exactly with the issue of cascade. Okay. This common Parkinson's symptom, automatic action. We've written all our lives. We just think the words and they kind of come out of the end of the pen, right? So when a person with Parkinson tries to write, they go, now is the... And it all turns out to be on this one little spot right there. Because the mind is far in front of what they're doing. They're not finishing the letter. Right? So this is, an in, this is an incomplete, each letter is incomplete. One way to break it, get lined paper, like in second grade, and print. And have, you know, they, the, my grandson still has the three lines, you know, so you do the, the tall and then the short, and, the, and then you print and you stop after each one. You stop after each one, and you say the letter out loud as you make it. This pulls the mind back into the present moment. Right? The mind wants to be ahead of itself. The mind, I mean, all of us have done it all our lives. We're always thinking of the thing that we're going to do while we're doing this thing. Right? That's, that's what makes us efficient. But with Parkinson's, you've got to be thinking about this thing while you're doing it. Like a Zen monk. We have Zen monks in Colorado. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, we have a question over here. Yep. You talk about conscious movement, and I'm addressing this to people with Parkinson's and also the caregivers. Conscious movement doesn't just happen. So how do caregivers encourage the people that they're caring for to do the conscious movement? And then how do you also try and get people with Parkinson's to actually be conscious, because that's the problem. It's great to say conscious movement is important, but how do people with Parkinson's learn conscious movement? Okay, very good. You don't ask easy questions, do you? <laughs> All right, conscious movement. How does the caregiver help the person get, get, get on with conscious movement, recover from a, an unconscious attempt and refocus their mind into the present moment. Uh, <clears throat> this is called in the literature, this is called cueing, cueing. You give the person a cue, right? And this is also a theater term, right? When the person on stage forgets their line, they say line, and this person reads the cue, okay, that cue. 
and okay, and you're back on. Uh, that only happens in rehearsal. Uh, okay, uh, you got it, nobody else did. <laughs> okay, so here, I'll, I'll try this. Uh, and I'm going to, to, I'm going to do this first myself, and then I'm going to ask for a volunteer. There are a whole group of people with Parkinson's who take such extremely short steps that sometimes they even go, okay. You all know, everybody's seen somebody, if, they, if not their partner, somebody in the hall here. You see this little, I call this a, a stutter step. Okay, a stutter step where they're trying to take a forward movement and they get out there and they're like that. Okay, here's a little game that shifts that into a conscious movement. That is precisely a cascade. The person's trying to take the second and the third step before he's taken the first. His mind is already five steps away, way out in front of him. So he's already out there and the legs can't keep up, okay? Cascade, automatically does, automatic does not work reliably. Here's the game. And Carol, uh, maybe you can come back. Yeah, you're going to be my first. Uh, so here's the game. The person who is helping that person will say, stop. First part of the game. Estimate, she'll say, estimate. How far is it over to the chair? How many steps will it take you to get? Not 10 feet, but how many steps will it take you? So she asked me. How many steps will it take you to get to the end of the stage? OK, I'll say eight. I say eight. And then she says, count them out loud. Count them out loud. So I go, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> so that's called estimation technique. Estimation technique. So I'm not walking anymore, am I? I am measuring, right? I'm measuring the distance. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I make an estimation. Estimation slips me into the conscious thing. I estimate how many steps it'll be, right? So I call it estimation technique. Estimate and then count out loud. Doesn't matter if you're accurate. What matters is that you've made a plan in your head to get there. The second one is, now measure this, the steps. Measure them. So that separates each step from the, each step separated from another step. This is the one step. And this is not an, just another step. This is the two step. This one's the third one. So, so the mind is in it, each one, right? So the mind is, is tracking the whole time. Good. So and now everybody, uh, do I have somebody here who actually does have a lot of freezing? Freezing is very common. Somebody who is able-bodied, I don't want to injure anybody either. So somebody who can survive my tender mercies. You got the, exactly the person for me? Okay, will you come on up? Okay, now I'm going to ask Diane to estimate how many steps will it ta take you to get, you see where Carol is over there, the yellow, yellow scarf? How many steps will it take you to get to her and shake her hand? Um, 13. 13, okay. Now count the steps out loud, very loud so everybody can hear. Off you go. Okay, now then, I'm going to give you a path that you cannot see, but you're going to have to estimate anyway. How many steps will it take you to walk all the way around this table and come back to me, this table here, just get behind all those people, and come around here and shake my hand? Twelve. Twelve, okay. Count them out loud, really loud. Just 
Doesn't matter how accurate they are. You ready? Count them real loud so everybody can hear. Go. Nineteen. Very good. Okay. So now she walked along a path she couldn't see, right? And did you notice she went between narrow spaces all the way around, right? Narrow spaces. The place where Parkinson's people always get hung up, right? That little narrow weaving in and out. Now, make it even harder. See these two tables here? Yeah. How many steps will it take you? And I don't want anybody to move your chair an iota. <laughs> to go all the way around these two tables and come back here to me. Give yourself lots of room. 30. 30, she says. Off she goes. Loud. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Keep counting. One, two, three, four, eighty-five, thirty-six. Good. Is that unusual for you? Is that unusual for you? To walk around. Like yeah, that? without any stutter steps. Yeah, it depends on when the time of day. Actually. When the time of the day. Yeah. Well, today she did without a single step. And did you, did you notice, those of you who are close enough to see, that she's turning to go into narrow spaces? She's doing these little adjustments as she goes, right? She's stepping over things. She's not, you know, she's not, she's working her way through narrow spaces. The kind of stuff that Parkinson's people cannot do, but she can do it. All right, that's the estimation technique. Thank you very much. You. So, another question. We have one last question down over this way. I'm waving my hand. There we go. Okay. I learned that. That's that stretch thing you did. <laughs> Are there any ways to help uh, get off the floor without a chair? Yes, there are. Yes. And uh, <clears throat> that's, it's very similar to, this, to the one where you use a chair. The question is, can you get up without a, without a chair? What if you're out in the open, walking across a grassy field or... You stumbled in the middle of the street, right? Uh, and you've gone down. Well, the first thing to do, of course, is to check and see if you are hurt. Look at your hands, see if you're bleeding anywhere. And then refuse all help. <laughs> because the helpers are going to be levering you and getting you by the back of your pants and doing all kinds of weird stuff. So here's how you do it. And I hope everybody, if people in the back can't see me, you could stand up a little bit and get, get this. I'm going to be down on the floor. It's very similar to using the chair. You remember when the chair was here? What I did was <clears throat> I crawled to the chair, got my hands up on the chair, brought my foot up outside my elbow, ducked my head, lifted my backside, and pulled my feet close together and stood all the way up. Ta-da! Now, the chair's not here. And I'm down. Ah, I look for the chair, no chair. Okay, so I set myself up. I come up on my fingertips, if that helps. And I bring knee up outside my elbow. Got it? Not inside. Inside, you see how my knee my knee doesn't bend. Can't, I can't get it to 90 degrees. If it's inside my elbow, it's only this far. It's not 90 yet. The knee doesn't really get strong till it gets to 90 degrees. This is 90 degrees. Okay? Then I put a lot of weight on my hands and lift my backside and scoop my back foot up to me, pick up the baby. Here we go. And I'm up. Well, I lied when I said there was only one more question. We have a question uh, from Anthony, who is 
uh, heading up uh, our soon-to-be new boxing program uh -huh. uh, that we're very excited about starting. So, Anthony. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to use random names, just made up names. If I have Mr. Smith and Mr. Johnson as the new clients and patients, and I have Mr. Smith willing to work out with me four days a week, exercise, staying active, and I have Mr. Johnson that doesn't want to work out, kind of stubborn, kind of depressed over the disease he has, is Mr. Smith going to have a longer lifespan and keeping the disease at bay instead of Mr. Johnson? He's going to live a little bit longer and have a little bit of symptoms. Like he's not going to slip into the next stage as their patient will get in there a little bit faster. I overall, I want to give the confidence of the, the benefits of exercise, of keeping it at bay, slowing it down as much as possible, keeping the guy consistent on activity. And the, the other, since the other one don't want to work out as much, I mean, is that yeah. true that you'll slip into the next disease faster than the other that doesn't exercise? Uh, okay, let me, let me try that. It's kind of a complicated question, but not, not a good one, really good one. Um, I, I teach my classes. I, I have three classes running. I have a beginner's class, a freshman class, and a sophomore class. Three different classes. Uh, the beginners are people who are just starting to work with me. So I take a lot of personal time with each one of them. I keep that class small, never goes over eight. And I coach those folks over and over on all the basic moves. And I take them through the whole program. Takes about four or five months. The freshman class meets Monday morning. These are the people who their disease has progressed to the place I have two in wheelchairs there and two that come in with a walker. They're able to surrender their walker and, and do work then. And then four who are quite stiff. They've got a lot of stiffness. Uh, there's one guy who is pretty able, but he, mentally he can't keep track of things. He cannot remember what we did last week. Okay? Sometimes he can't remember what we did at the beginning of the lesson. So this middle class, the freshmen, I have to do the same exercises over and over and over. I'm, I'm kind of fighting a rear guard, trying to keep them from getting any worse, not trying to get them better. I do, some of them do actually get some better, but I'm not trying to push them beyond what they're capable of, right? If I'm pushing them too hard, then they're going to get discouraged. They feel like they're not pleasing me. They feel like they can't keep up, they feel, it, it depresses them, it makes them more sad. So I try to teach that class so that they have a victory every class, right? It's sort of like working with, with second graders, you know, you want everybody to win. You don't want to just have, you know, one loser and the rest of you guys are, you know, you're over there. You want everybody to win in that class. The third class is my sophomores. Now these are the people who are quite able-bodied, and I really challenge them. And I do experiments with them. I try things that I don't know whether they're going to work. Right? So they're, they're colleagues in a certain sense. I work them really hard. When they finish a class, they should be tired. Right? I, I don't give them the same lesson every time. I, I make up new stuff. I had them dancing Zorba the Greek the other day. And I'm not kidding. We had Zorba on. Ta, ta. You know, we had Zorba, and we speeded it up, and they stayed up with it, okay? So you, you want to kind of divide your people into levels if, if you're working with, you know, if you can. I know sometimes it's not physically possible, but you want to be careful not to try pushing too hard. Uh, there are some people, I, I do push a few. There's a guy in a Monday class who was, who was really sort of on strike, Right? He didn't get into the nursing home he wanted, the people there. He's an old labor organizer is what he is. He's a born troublemaker. So this guy was, was making a lot of trouble, and, and he wouldn't do this, and he wouldn't do that, and he wouldn't do that, and it was getting worse and worse. So I told him, I can't work with somebody who doesn't want to work for themselves. You know, I was pretty tough with him. And that moved him and got him on the, on the beam. But that's a rare thing. Got me? That's a rare thing. 
Thank you very much. Okay. Excellent. Let's hear it. That was. Whew. I have something to aspire to, and that's to touch the ground going to the side like you can. <laughs> and getting my butt up in the air like that. It's like, uh, again, let's thank uh, John Argue. That was absolutely stupendous and so helpful.